Welcome back to a new episode. Now, I know a lot of you come here for a very rational and a very logical approach to the analysis of design. In this episode, I'm going to be checking out the autos from Grand Theft Auto, where the crazier, the better. No rules, nothing analytical in the truest sense, just pure fun. So on to the first design. We're looking at the Pegasi Tesseract. My gosh, this thing is absolutely nuts. This thing eats small dogs, small cats, and small children for breakfast. That's what it looks like. Like the mechanical aspect of it, where you can actually see a lot of the stuff working, the suspension on the front. The surfaces are crazy a bit diabolical they're slab sided they're also curved i mean when you say mishmash this is a pretty cool mishmash you got the engine on display whatever kind of engine it has is on display in the back the vents on their side are, are violent the wheels are violent when i look at some of the other pictures of this car from behind it looks a little bit tame i mean i cannot understand where in a world where they do not abide by the rules they still feel like they have to put a mesh on the back of the car. Who cares about safety in a vehicle like this? That driver pushed over on the left side of the vehicle needs to be in the middle of a vehicle like this. You don't really carry passengers around in this. It's, uh, you're scared as a passenger in a car like this. You don't want to go with anybody who's driving it. And at a price point of $2.7 million, this is not a vehicle you really want to share with anybody. Car number two, the Anis S80RR, whatever that stands for. This car is described as being very bad on your bones, very bad on your internal organs, but it's a 1970s design. This car is like a Group C racer, a beautiful Group C racer. If you were gonna drive this car on the road, please, please make sure you're driving on a really nice road. This car has the closest thing to minimal ground clearance that any moving object has. If you hit a bump, you're gone. This thing is gonna jump up in the air and start to fly. The front end of this car kind of reminds me of what we called cow catchers in the old days where the trains had to have something to scoop up the bison off the railway and they would flip them off to the side. So you can imagine if you hit a small child, that ch small child is not gonna go under the car. It's definitely gonna go over that car. You're taking somebody's ankles out for sure with this one. I mean, it's an amazing looking car. I love the bubble. Uh, greenhouse on there it reminds me of a p3 p4 ferrari nicely curved windscreens in the front kind of feels like you're inside of a glass dome or a glass sphere visibility incredible the lights here i mean with a car like this okay it does look like 1970s and the headlights are about as cheap as you can put on a car but again they work on a car like this because the overall design is very conservative as much as you want to think it's uh, a pretty high-tech looking car it's actually a pretty low-tech looking car because everything on this car has been done. For blocky designs, it's pretty cool. Ding ding, don't forget to get your orders in, in time for Christmas delivery. Now the next car has the coolest name, Lampadati Tigon. Now the Lampadati Tigon looks to be heavily influenced by the design of a, a great friend of mine, a great designer, uh, Joe Wong, who's responsible for the design of the new De Tommaso P72. Look that one up, and I don't think you can design a car to look any more Italian or any more uh, sensual, sexy, whatever you want to call it. The influence on this car is in a great way, in the sense that it really makes this car look voluptuous into the max it's uh it's incredibly beautiful i think and i'm looking through the range of photographs definitely a throwback to the early days of of this type of car of the de tomaso era 
and you can see a lot of the Ferrari influence, maybe the Italian style at the time, you know, in the 60s, where you get these very, very rounded uh, surfaces. This car, it may not look modern, but it probably does look timeless. I mean, the mouth, again, it's one of those <laughs> exaggerated mouths, uh, but it does make it look like it uh, eats, eats kids for breakfast. The arrow effect bits and pieces on here are a bit uh, pasted on or attached, so it doesn't really look like it's modern. The headlights, they've attempted to make a modern looking headlight, but it's a bit of a mishmash. In profile, the car looks pretty pretty interesting. I mean, because it's based on the P72, that, that, that Tommaso, it can't look bad. It's super sensual. It's got a slitherness to it, which is exciting. Now number four, the Overflawed Entity XXR. Who comes up with these names? We're looking at here at something that looks very, very heavily influenced by the Koenigsegg, perhaps the Ajera. Koenigsegg have that typical, almost like mail slot, post box opening window where you're sitting way back and the roof goes on pretty far and the instrument panel goes on pretty far and you've got a slot for a window. Good job. Um, a little bit basic, it looks a bit flat to me, a little bit like the, uh, the, the, the fuselage, the body of this car has been squashed. The front end of this car, okay, so they've thought about some aero features like the canards and the dive planes on the side there. The intakes on the front of the car with a, mm, it's kind of like a spoiler hanging off the bottom, the wing underneath there, the air dam. This car looks pretty aggressive from the front. I love the louvers on the bonnet. Headlights are a bit funky. In all, I wouldn't be excited about driving this car. Uh, from a design standpoint, no doubt it goes like a bat out of heck. Um, but yeah, it's just rather mundane. Yeah, it's a Koenigsegg. Not a nice one, but it's a Koenigsegg. Moving on to car number five. We're looking at the Trufade Thrax or the Trufade Thrax. Now this car obviously is based off of a Bugatti uh, which one, I don't know. It could be the Veyron, could be the Devo, not sure. But there is an influence, obviously, on the side view from that vehicle. It's interesting. It's almost like the front of the car slides in, under, and through the rear end of the car. Almost kind of two volumes coming together. But it works for Bugatti. It's got a lot of that past influence of their graphics. It's edgier, absolutely edgier than a, than a Bugatti. The one thing I really kind of like on this car that really attracts me is the intakes on the front of the car. Now we've got that massive central intake that all Bugattis have, and then you got the massive side intakes. And then this car not only has those intakes, it also has more massive intakes on the bonnet area, on the hood area. So the whole front end looks like somebody went at it with a samurai sword or something. The reason I like all of that violence on the front of the car is because this should be a violent car. No matter probably what car I was driving, if I saw this sneaking up behind me, I would probably pull over and let it go by me. The approach that they've taken with this is the same approach that they should have applied to the previous one that looked like a Koenigsegg. That would have livened up that version and given it that statement of aggressiveness that this one certainly does have. Moving on to number six. Now we're looking at the Progen Tyrus. Fairly immediately recognizable as being influenced from the McLaren F1 from the mid 90s, the GTR long tail version, because this one definitely has what we call a long tail. That means the back of the car extends way past the rear wheels. Yeah, a lot going on. A lot of things that don't really work well because of the displacement, let's say the, the, the mispositioning of the intakes on the side. Neither of them look like they relate to each other. Um, hard to say if they even work. I mean, I'm sure it doesn't have to work because it's a game car, but at the same time, if you're gonna design a car like this, at least make it look credible. It's not enough to say there's a hole there. You've gotta double the surface inwards. You gotta curve it inwards to get some air to attach and to move inwards to, to hit the intakes properly to get sufficient amount of air into the, uh, the engine. 
Um, still, it looks like a race car, but it's one of those things that have been built in a shed somewhere. It's not the most cohesive front end design that I've ever seen. What I do like about this car is the snorkel on the roof. Now, I don't really like the way it's designed uh, because it's a bit rough, but at the same time, it's always a great idea to put an intake on the top of the roof because that's where you're gonna get most of the attached air in a clean manner. In other words, the air that comes in there is typically cool. The rear end is a bit disappointing because, because again, like on that the previous one we were talking about, which didn't have a lot going on, very little surface entertainment, car lets itself down by the rear end design, I think. And also there's a huge problem, I would say, with a car that looks a little bit overbodied, undertired. Again, nice car, yet it remains very boring for me at the rear of the car. Aggressive, but boring, if that makes any sense. Anyways, not my favorite car. Number seven, the Principe de Veste 8. First impression is, wow, this car looks designed to do some damage, uh, to inflict pain. That front end is about as pointed as you can imagine a car to be which is probably a good thing because these cars are meant to scare people off the track, scare your competitors off the track. Now, whether that's good or not, I don't know. It lacks refinement, but at the same time, these cars are not about refinement. These cars are about making an incredible statement. Hard to say it's influenced by any other car because I've never seen a car that looks like this. The intake is phenomenal. The side intake on this car, it looks like it's all meant to be a side air intake. I kind of like it. I mean, again, it's about, it's it, it's not about being real or meeting regulations or homologation. It's about your first feeling when you see a car like this. And I think this car would just scare me the first time I saw it. This is the first one I've come across where I would love to sit inside of it and just see what the feeling is like, and then maybe drive it. But again, it's uh, this is definitely a wild, wild west machine. Now on to number eight, the De Classe Scramjet. It's really almost like a toy car, matchbox type car. This car is fun. It looks like you would have a, a lot of fun driving this car, maybe even flying it. It looks like it could actually take off. It represents something out of a joyful time when cars were more about sculpture, beautiful art forms, almost a comic book type vehicle where you would see it, uh, like I said, in a, in a 60s science fiction film. It's cool, I like this one. This is probably my favorite one. Surprisingly right now, it's got all the elements of being aggressive and being still very pretty, I guess, aggressively pretty. But this is kind of like Dick Dastardly or, you know, again, Thunderbirds or something like that. And it looks like it would be a lot of fun to drive something like this. I would almost imagine this car being atomic powered. Who knows? Cool. And on to number nine, the Grotti X80 Proto. No, I don't think I'm gonna even waste my time. This thing is ugly. I mean, you deserve a five-star water level just for getting in this thing. FBI, open up! Well, and certainly, Gary, the hope is that this person will decide to pull over and uh, stop and, and, and end this peacefully. Number 10, Grotti Turismo 4. Oh wait, this thing looks like one of mine. Is this a P1 maybe? Definitely is attractive looking. This one, I guess they put a bit more time <laughs> into refining it. The car is pretty. I mean, it doesn't shock me. I can see a greenhouse coming off of the LaFerrari. I can see a body side that's coming off the P1. Back end, very P1-esque. It's kind of cool. I mean, maybe if I had to choose a car, this is more to my taste. Headlights are a zero. I don't like the headlights. Fairly attractive. I like the high-mounted mirrors. Uh, no guessing why, I do like high-mounted mirrors. 
The car does look a bit like an Italian P1, or it looks like a English LaFerrari. Probably the prettiest car on of the bunch. Whether it's good and nice and appropriate to be pretty at a ball where only monsters are attending, I don't know. Maybe in that kind of aggressive environment, it's a little bit too sweet. Yet, I do like it. Maybe it's just not aggressive enough for this game. He needs a few bruises, a few new broken bones, and then he'll probably start to fit in. And now, moving on to the last one, the Pegasi Vaca. Now, that's a really interesting name. For all those who speak Spanish, Vaca actually means cow. So maybe it's the Pegasi cow. I can tell you right off the bat, this looks like a McLaren MP4-12C. Probably what this car could use is a more interesting graphic. It doesn't look very wild. It's a solid color and it makes it look a little bit tame. For me, I think I would rather get down and dirty and use one of the other designs, one of the other cars where you have a little bit more of a bully look almost. So you look a little bit more uh, capable, I guess, of handling yourself. It's nice, again, to say that the cars that are at the higher end are the ones that look more outlandish, more outrageous than these cars here. So if it was me playing this game and me having to drive one of these cars, and maybe it's slightly because of my uh, love, my passion for aviation, but it would probably be the Dick Classic Scramjet. I think it's probably the nicest car for me to be driving where I can feel like I am out to win the race. So this one is it, the Dick Classic Scramjet. So thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments below which is your favorite. And if you have any favorites from any other car games, do let me know again, and we'll look at having a review on those too. So until the next episode, signing out. Thank you. Take care.